Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa This evening I'm going to go through one of the suttas in the Diganakaya Sagalaka Sutta this sutta has been called the uh, Vinaya for Laymen. It's a very down-to-earth kind of guide to to living, um, dealing with uh, different uh, relationships and different situations that come up for people in the world. And in some ways it's quite... Um, relatable to modern times, even though uh, we're dealing with the social and cultural situation of ancient India. The advice that the Buddha gives here is uh, very pertinent even to our situations today. In this sutta, the Buddha is speaking to a layman named Sigalaka, who lived in Rajagaha. Thus have I heard, once the Lord was staying at Rajagaha, at the squirrel's feeding place in the bamboo grove. At that time, Sigalaka, the householder's son, having got up early and gone out of Rajagaha, was paying homage with wet clothes and hair, with joined palms, to the different directions, to the east, the south, the west, the north, the nadir, and the zenith. And the Lord, having risen early and dressed, took his robe and bowl and went to Rajagaha for alms. And seeing Sagalaka paying homage to the different directions, he said, Householder son, why have you got up early to pay attention to the different directions? Lord, my father, when he was dying, told me to do so. And so, Lord, out of respect for my father's words, which I revere, honor, and hold sacred, I have got up early thus to pay homage in this way to the six directions. So, Sagalaka is gone out of his house early in the morning. He said, said he had wet hair and clothes, probably uh, due to doing ritual washing was well, very common practice in, in India um, purifying himself before performing this ceremony of paying homage to the six directions and the Buddha replies but householder son that is not the right way to pay homage to the six directions according to the Aryan discipline well, Lord, how should one pay homage to the six directions according to the Orion discipline? It would be good if the Blessed One were to teach me the proper way to pay homage to the six directions according to the Orion discipline. Then listen carefully, pay attention, and I will speak. So this is something that the the Buddha, in his teaching, he, he often did. This is a quite striking example of... Uh, taking some cultural form that was that was known to um, the people and then giving it a new a new meaning infusing it with a new meaning uh, according to his teaching this is even the case with the four noble truths which is the fundamental teaching of buddhism in that it follows the formula of a vedic medical text dealing with the, the first noble truth is the symptoms, the second noble truth is the cause, the third is the prognosis, and the fourth is the remedy. But here in this case, he's, taken, he's going to give a special meaning to each of the six directions. But before he, um, before he gets into that, he gives some, some general teaching. Uh, basic morality. Young householder, 
It is by abandoning the four defilements of action, by not doing evil from the four causes, by not following the six ways of wasting one substance, through avoiding these fourteen evil ways that the Aryan disciple covers the six directions, and by such practice becomes a conqueror of both worlds, so that all will go well with him in the, this world and the next, and the breaking up of the body after death, he will go to a good destiny, a heavenly world. So with this statement, the Buddha is setting the context of this particular teaching. This is not one of the higher teachings that leads to Nibbana, but it leads to a, a better rebirth. What are the four defilements of action that are abandoned? Taking life is one. Taking what is not given is one. Sexual misconduct is one. Lying speech is one. These are the four defilements of action that he abandons. Thus the Lord spoke. So this is um, four of the five precepts. Not killing, not stealing, not committing sexual misconduct, and not telling falsehoods. And the welfare... That's the Buddha having, that's the translation for Sugata. Welfare having spoken, the teacher added this. And then we have a, a verse, a line of verse. Taking life and stealing, lying, adultery, the wise reprove. Prose translation, there's no attempt here to imitate the rhythm of the Pali verse. What are the four causes of evil from which he refrains? Evil action springs from attachment. It springs from ill will. It springs from folly. And it springs from fear. If the Orion disciple does not act out of attachment, ill will, folly, or fear, he will not do evil from any of these four causes. This, these four factors... Um, are given elsewhere as uh, things to purify one's mind from when making a decision. And any course of action that's based on attachment, on uh, ill will, or sometimes it's, it's phrased as anger, folly or delusion, or from fear, will be a, an action that's ill-advised and and not lead to good consequences. Then there's another uh, two stanza of verse. Desire and hatred, fear and folly, he who breaks the law through these loses all his fair repute, like the moon at waning time. Desire and hatred, fear and folly, he who never yields to these grows in goodness and repute, like the moon at waxing time. Then he goes on to the six ways of wasting someone's substance that a wise person does not follow. Addiction to strong drink and sloth-producing drugs is one way of wasting someone's substance. Haunting the streets at unfitting times is one. Attending fairs is one. Being addicted to gambling is one. Keeping bad company is one. Habitual idleness is one. There are these six dangers attached to addiction. Then he goes to each one in particular. There are these six dangers attached to addiction to strong drink and sloth-producing drugs. <coughs> Present waste of money, increase of quarreling, liability to sickness, loss of good name, indecent exposure of one's person, and weakening of the intellect. So this is very uh, down-to-earth, common-sense teaching. There are six dangers attached to haunting the streets at unfitting times. One is defenseless and without protection, and so are one's wife and children, and so is one's property. One is suspected of crimes, and false reports are pinned on one. 
and one encounters all sorts of unpleasantness. There are these six dangers attached to frequenting fairs. One is always thinking, where is the dancing? Where is the singing? Where are they playing music? Where are they reciting? Where is their hand clapping? Where are the drums? Seems to be just a uh, waste of time and frivolity. Is seen as the danger here. There are six dangers attached to gambling. The winner makes enemies. The loser bewails his loss. One wastes one's present wealth. One's word is not trusted in the assembly. One is despised by one's friends and companions. One is not in demand for marriage because a gambler cannot afford to maintain a wife. There are six dangers attached to keeping bad company. Any gambler, any glutton, any drunkard, any cheat, any trickster, any bully is his friend and companion. There are six dangers attached to idleness. Thinking it's too cold, one does not work. Thinking it's too hot, one does not work. It's too early, one does not work. Thinking it is too late, one does not work. Thinking I am too hungry, one does not work. Thinking I am too full, one does not work. <laughs> The uh, welfare having spoken, the teachers added, and then again, uh, this, basically the same teaching repeated in verse. Some are drinking mates, and some profess their friendship to your face, but those who are your friends in need, they alone are friends indeed. Sleeping late adultery, picking quarrels, doing harm, evil friends and stinginess, these six things destroy a man. He who goes with wicked friends and spends his time in wicked deeds. In this world and the next as well, this man will come to suffer woe. Dicing, wenching, drinking too, dancing, singing, daylight sleep, untimely prowling, evil friends and stinginess destroy a man. He who plays with dice and drinks strong drink and goes with others well-loved wives, he takes the lower, baser cook course and fades away like waning moon. The drunkard, broke and destitute, ever thirsting as he drinks, like stone and water sinks in debt, soon bereft of all his kin. He who spends his days in sleep and makes the night his waking time, ever drunk and lecherous, cannot keep a decent home. Too cold, too hot, too late, they cry, thus pushing all their work aside till every chance they might have had of doing good has slipped away. But he who reckons cold and heat as less than straws, and like a man, undertakes the task in hand, his joy will never grow the less. Then it, we return to uh, uh, the Buddha speaking in prose. Householder son, there are these four types who can be seen as foes and friendly guys. The man who is all take is one. The great talker is one, the flatterer is one, and the fellow spendthrift is one. The man who is all take can be seen to be a false friend for four reasons. He takes everything. He wants a lot for very little. What he must do he does out of fear, and he seeks his own ends. The great talker can be seen to be a false friend for four reasons. He talks of favors in the past and in the future. He mouths empty phrases of goodwill, and when something needs to be done in the present, he pleads inability owing to some disaster. The flatterer can be seen to be a false friend for four reasons. He assents to bad actions. He dissents from good actions. He praises you to your face, and he disparages you behind your back. The fellow spendthrift can be seen to be a false friend for four reasons. He is a companion when you indulge in strong drink, when you haunt the streets at unfitting times, when you frequent fairs, and when you indulge in gambling. Thus the Lord spoke, and the welfare having spoken, the teacher added, The friend who seeks what he can get, the friend who talks but empty words, the friend who merely flatters you, the fellow who is a fellow wastrel, these four are really foes, not friends. The wise men recognizing this, 
should hold himself aloof from them as from some path of panic fear. The Buddha often spoke about the importance of keeping good companions uh, to associate with the wise and, and the virtuous so that uh, you raise yourself up by your associates and not uh, drag yourself down by associating with bad company. In the Vasudhi Maga, when the, uh, the section that talks about developing the different uh, spiritual faculties, and it says uh, uh, different um, different ways and means of developing faculties like samadhi and faith and uh, energy. Uh, one of them is always uh, to develop energy, associate with the energetic and avoid the non-energetic people. To develop uh, wisdom, associate with the wise and avoid the foolish. Then he goes on, the next section, he talks about good. what makes good friends. He says, Householder son, there are these four types who can be seen to be loyal friends. The friend who is a helper is one. The friend who is the same in happy and unhappy times is one. The friend who points out what is good for you and the friend who is sympathetic. The helpful friend can be seen to be a loyal friend in four ways. He looks after you when you are inattentive. He looks after your possessions when you are inattentive. He is a refuge when you are afraid. And when some business is to be done, he lets you have twice what you ask for. The uh, commentary to this passage uh, is a curious note to, to talking about looking after you when you're inattentive and looking after your property when you're inattentive. It says, for example, when you're drunk. Mm -hmm. The friend who is the same in happy and unhappy times can be seen to be a, a loyal friend in four ways. He tells you his secrets. He guards your secrets. He does not let you down in misfortune and would even sacrifice his life for you. The friend who points out what is good for you can be seen to be a loyal friend in four ways. He keeps you from wrongdoing. He supports you in doing good. He informs you of what you did not know. He points out the path to heaven. The sympathetic friend can be seen to be a loyal friend in four ways. He does not rejoice at your misfortune. He rejoices at your good fortune. He stops others who speak against you. And he commends others who speak in praise of you. Thus the Lord spoke. And again, the, the Buddha repeats the same basic teaching in, in verse. The friend who is a helper and the friend in times both good and bad, the friend who shows the way that's right, the friend who's full of sympathy, these four kinds of friends the wise should know at their true worth and he should cherish them with care, just like a mother would her dearest child. The wise man trained in discipline shines out like a beacon light. He gathers wealth just as the bee gathers honey, and it grows like an anthill higher yet. With wealth so gained, the layman can devote it to his people's good. He should divide his wealth in four. This will most advantage bring. One part he may enjoy at will. Two parts should be put to work. The fourth part he should set aside as reserve in times of need. So this is how you know, down to earth and practical this particular sutta is, that the Buddha is actually giving your financial advice. And uh, it's a um, formula that uh, I think would be very difficult for people to, uh, to meet. Whatever wealth you have, you should only live off one-fourth of it. Um, one half should be put back into your your business and uh, the final quarter should be uh, reserved as, as saving as a uh, like an, a fund for uh, hard times
So usually the the Buddhist teaching, this suit is unusual in that way. Most of the Buddhist teaching is very more spiritual, higher level of how to, with the goal of making an end of, of suffering and ending samsara, realizing nibbana. But the Buddha does occasionally deal with more mundane matters about how to uh, how to conduct yourself in the world. So this sutta is particularly directed that way, and we saw that at the earlier point. I uh, earlier point in the text, I pointed out that um, he set the goal of this sutta as taking a fortunate rebirth being reborn as a fortunate human or a dewa. So that already marked it out that it was not uh, a teaching directed towards the unconditioned. So the Buddha taught at different levels and in, and he would judge it by his, his uh, audience to a large degree. And uh, this man, uh, 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 Sagalaka, was... Um, Obviously, he was a good man. He was, you know, he starts out by showing that by he was revering the te- rever- revering the statements of his dying father and carrying them out. But he's also a worldly man. He's living in the world and uh, probably doesn't have high spiritual aspirations. So the Buddha is helping him with a teaching on how to live in in this world. So, so far, it's been kind of general teachings. Now it gets to the what, what I think is the really interesting part of the sutta, where he goes through the six directions. And he identifies each of the directions with a, a human relationship. And we're uh, taking as the central figure is the Sagalaka, who is um, a layman of probably of the merchant class, uh, of uh, middling wealth, and um, uh, a householder, meaning he had a family, and he's taking him as the central character and uh, analyzing the different relationships that a human being has. Uh, you could take the same sort of formula for any person, you know, male or female, rich or poor, they're going to be at some center of their own matrix of relationships. But here we're dealing with this uh, middle class, urban, uh, adult male, family man, and then his relationships. How householder son does the Orion disciple pro- protect the six directions? There are six things to be regarded as the six directions. The east denotes mother and father. The south denotes teachers. The west denotes wife and children. The north denotes friends and companions. The nadir denotes servants, workers and helpers. The zenith denotes ascetics and brahmins. So in each of these, and then he goes through each of these relationships, and uh, each relationship, there will be uh, duties to be performed to fulfill the uh, uh, to fulfill what's required for righteousness in that relationship, and the other person will have reciprocal duties to be performed. Uh, the Pali is kind of uh, interesting here because it, it indicates that for the, the man he's addressing, his actions should be motivated by duty. Then he can expect that the other person will reciprocate out of compassion. So this means you're not, it's not really an exchange. You're not owed reciprocal actions, but uh, if everybody is living according to their own uh, duty, or atta in Pali, or arta in Sanskrit, if they're living according to their own duty, then everything will be harmonious. So you don't have a right to expect anything back, but you ha- you can hope that out of compassion you will receive the 
a proper response. So now he analyzes these relationships. There are five ways in which a son should minister to his father and mother as the Eastern directions. He should think, having been supported by them, I will support them. I will perform their duties for them. I will keep up the family tradition. I will be worthy of my heritage. And at my parents' death, I will distribute gifts on their behalf. And there are five ways in which the parents, so ministered to by their son as the eastern direction, will reciprocate. They will restrain him from evil, support him in doing good, teach him some skill, find him a suitable wife, in due time hand over the inheritance to him. In this way the eastern direction is covered, making it at peace and free from fear. There are five ways in which pupils should minister to their teachers as the southern direction. By rising to greet them, by waiting on them, by being attentive, by serving them, by mastering the skills that they teach. And there are five ways in which the teachers, thus ministered to by their pupils, as the southern direction, will reciprocate. They will give thorough instruction making sure they have grasped what they should have duly grasped, give them a thorough grounding in all skills, recommend them to their friends and colleagues, and provide them with security in all directions. In this way, the southern direction is covered, making it at peace and free from fear. You still see that in the Asian cultures today, that people have a very high respect for teachers. Thais would find it the, the kind of casual way some um, teachers and students relate in, in Western educational systems. Is often would, they would find that you know, out of place. There are five ways in which a husband should minister to his wife as the Western direction. By honoring her, by not disparaging her, by not being unfaithful to her, by giving authority to her, by providing her with adornments. And that last, providing her with adornments, is not really a frivolous thing. In uh, India, um, the woman's jewelry is like her personal wealth. So if you know if she's if she loses her her husband or comes into some kind of hard times, she's got something to fall back on. And there are five ways in which the wife, being ministered to by her husband as the Western direction, will reciprocate by properly organizing her work, by being kind to the servants, by not being unfaithful, by protecting stores, and by being skilled and diligent in all she has to do. In this way, the Western direction is covered, making it at peace and free from fear. Well, one thing that's interesting in this paragraph is that um, ancient India uh, is generally considered to be a very patriarchal society, very male-dominated. But we can see here quite in, in the Buddha's teaching quite an uh, even-handed reciprocal approach. There's no double standard. The, the husband and wife are both admonished to be faithful to one another. And um, the wife is... To be given authority, meaning that the uh, ruling of the home, you know, this is her domain, is the home. And, uh, uh, she, she's in charge, with, with, uh, uh, while the, the husband's duty is to provide, meaning he will you know, work at a, at a business or uh, for a salary. You know, she will um, maintain the, the home properly looking after the stores and organizing the work. And the mention of servants, you can, this is um, definitely an indication that Sagalaka was a, a middle class, probably a merchant, um, a Vasa caste, probably a fairly middle class or even upper middle class person. There are five ways in which a man should minister to his friends and companions as the northern direction, 
by gifts, by kindly words, by looking after their welfare, by treating them like himself, and by keeping his word. And there are five ways in which friends and companions, thus ministered to by a man as the northern direction, will reciprocate, by looking after him when he is inattentive, by looking after his property when he is inattentive, by being a refuge when he is afraid, by not deserting him when he is in trouble, and by showing concern for his children. In this way, the northern direction is covered, making it at peace and free from fear. There are five ways in which a master should minister to his servants and work people as the nadir, by arranging their work according to their strength, by supplying them with food and wages, by looking after them when they are ill, by sharing special delicacies with them, and by letting them off work at the right time. And there are five ways in which servants and work people, thus ministered to by their masters as the nadir, will reciprocate. They will get up before him, go to bed after him, take only what they are given, do their work properly, and be the bearers of his praise and good repute. In this way the nadir is covered, making it peace and free from fear. So this particular paragraph is really a statement of economic relations. And in India, uh, the relationship between the, the master and his workmen would have been a much more close and personal than, than you know, becomes in modern capitalist societies. Where not, uh, there would probably be um, uh, like a, a craftsman's shop where he's you know, making making vases or wheels or, or metal work and you know he's a few apprentices and they've got more of a personal relationship and it, it's interesting some of the details here they're almost like um could be easily translated into kind of uh code for um good labor relations uh, workmen's rights you know uh, not working them excess hours, uh, providing them with food and wages, looking after them when they are ill, so having a health benefits at your job. And the final one is there are five ways in which a man should minister to ascetics and Brahmins. There's Samanas and, Brahm and Brahmins. This is... Um, the phrase Samana Brahmana, this is a phrase that occurs often in the Pali texts referring to the holy men. And there are two kind of types. The, the Samanas were the hermits or ascetics, or the yogis, and the Brahmins were the priests, the ritualists. And they were the, the two classes of holy men in India. There are five ways to minister to them by kindness in bodily deed, speech, and thought, by keeping open house for them, by supplying their bodily needs. And the ascetics and Brahmins, thus ministered to by him as the zenith, will reciprocate in six ways. They will restrain him from evil, encourage him to do good, be benevolently compassionate towards him, teach him what he has not heard, clarify what he has heard, and point out the way to heaven. In this way, the zenith is covered. This was a big part of uh, Indian culture, was the, uh, the, the Samanas and Brahmins, and they were held in great, uh, great respect. It was a, a culture that put a lot of um, emphasis in general on the spiritual life and making uh, spiritual progress. The Buddha himself was uh, could be classed as a Samana. And sometimes he's called the Great Samana. And he's definitely uh, within that tradition of, the, of the, the yogis who went off into remote places to, to, to seek the truth. And the welfare, having spoken... The teacher added, and this is a the final verse, is basically a recapitulation again in verse. Mother and father are the east, teachers are the southward point, wife and child are the west, 
friend and colleagues are the north, servants and workers are below, ascetics, brahmins are above. These directions should all be honored by a clansman true. He who is wise and disciplined, kindly and intelligent, humble, free from pride, such a one may honor gain. Early rising, scorning sloth, unshaken by adversity, a faultless conduct, ready wit, such a one may honor gain, making friends and keeping them, welcoming no stingy host, a guide, philosopher, and friend, such a one may honor gain, giving gifts and kindly speech, a life well spent for others' good, even-handed in all things, impartial as each case demands. These things make the world go round, like the chariot's axle pin. If such things did not exist, no mother from her son would get any honor and respect, no father either as their due, but since these qualities are held by the wise and high esteem, they are given prominence and rightly praised by all. At these words, Sagalaka said to the Lord, Excellent, Reverend Gautama, excellent. It is as if someone were to set up what has been knocked down, or to point out the way to one who has got lost, or to bring an oil lamp into a dark place, so that those with eyes could see what was there. Just so, the Reverend Gautama has expounded the Dhamma in various ways. May the Reverend Dhamma accept me as a lay follower from this day forth, as long as life shall last. So I think you can see the uh, what I said at the beginning that uh, even though it's a very different cultural framework, uh, it's all really quite relatable. It's very human and down to earth. This particular teaching. One peripheral point that uh, I note when I uh, with these uh, six relationships is. Uh, one that's that's absent, it's not present, and I think the omission is significant. Uh, it's not nothing the Buddha, and nothing in the Buddhist teaching was arbitrary or accidental. But there's no relationship to the king, or the, the to government. So this is, wasn't seen probably by the Buddha as being an essential human relationship. He's talking here about how people live in society with each other, not how the society should be should be governed. I think there was a uh, uh, in the Buddhist teaching there was a very ambivalent attitude towards kingship or government in general. On the one hand, it was the the origin myth of the. The, the founding of, of a kingship um, has it being quite uh, quite ordinary that the people were after they um, began basically with the, after they began agriculture they, they there arose uh, problems of people stealing from each other and um, then other people would get angry and and strike them or kill them and society was quite chaotic and uh, they decided we need to sort this out we need to have an orderly arrangement so we'll elect someone to be the the king and have the right to punish wrongdoers so it was seen in this way as kind of a necessary evil on the other hand there's an ideal of kingship in the uh, wheel turning monarch who rules righteously without stick or sword but uh, he has magical magical abilities to do so it's not an ordinary thing but that's kind of an aside for you know the teaching of this sutta is about uh, living in society living harmoniously and uh, the whole uh, premise of these six directions is that uh, in all your relationships, uh, and you will have a specific set of duties to perform to fulfill that relationship. And they'll be different in each relationship, whether it's with the husband and wife or mother and child or uh, master and workman or friend and friend. 
all these different relationships that we have. And um, if we put our, our attention to fulfilling the duties incumbent on that relationship, then uh, we'll be fulfilling that. We'll be, we'll be making good karma. We'll be uh, improving our, our life. And if everyone were to live that way, society would be quite harmonious and well ordered, and there would be no uh, no trouble anywhere. It would, everything would be uh, peaceful, and um, they actually would then, in that case, there would be no need for any government. The, the king could hang up his sword and go fishing. Mm -hmm. So I'll leave it at that.